that they're not hearing our language. We're no longer using the same letters, the same words, the same um, composition. So thank you, Jill. We appreciate that. Um, so years ago, again in Georgia, I had the privilege of working with a geriatric psychiatrist who specialized in dementia. And you want to talk about keeping it real, this man was the most blunt doctor I have ever met, but I just was drawn to him because he was so good with family. He kept it real. He told them what to expect. He told them um, things that maybe somebody else didn't tell them, but they needed to hear. So every time that he would speak and I was available, I would go listen to him. And we'd have good conversations as well. And one of the things that really sticks out in my mind, and this has helped me so much with dealing with families and with the, with the uh, folks themselves, where whenever there are sudden changes in behavior, this is the three, the kind of the three-legged stool right here. Um, we always want to look at, is there something physically wrong, of course? Um, uh, urinary tract infection, do they have a broken bone, are they sore, do they have a skin tear, whatever it is that they may not be able to explain to you. <coughs> Number two is environment, and I'm bringing this up now because the whole rest of the talk, the whole rest of the time, I really want you to keep that in the back of your mind, that environment is so important, and I'm going to get back to that in just a sec. <coughs> Thirdly is medicine. Of course, there are times that, hey, we, physically he's okay, you know, the environment's good, we're, we're rolling along pretty well, but maybe the medicines need to be adjusted. And of course, that's when you want to bring in that doctor's opinion. Um, so just to focus a minute on environment. When I say environment, I am not talking about, oh, you know, Mr. Bob lives in a beautiful home and his family's just wonderful and they dress impeccably and they're just as sweet as can be. Um, environment is how are we dealing with them? What kind of environment are they in? Are they in a hostile environment? Are they in an environment where you don't understand what they're trying to say? Are they in an environment of safety issues? Hey, it may be a beautiful home, but that shade carpet that's coming back, you know, is not good for him or her. So the environment is going to be really, really important, and that's, like I said, keep that in the back of your mind because that is something that I want uh, all of us to focus on. So today, my purpose is to hopefully give you some tools for your toolbox. So whether you're uh, caring for a loved one at home, whether you're a professional, I know we have a lot of social workers, clinical staff in here, family members. These are all tools for all of our tool belts, okay? So these are the three things I'm going to be breaking down. Um, the power of positive persuasion, what to hold on to, what to let go, and then keeping it real in an unrealistic world. So the power of positive persuasion. Um, I'm not sure how, how many of you know the clinical side of it and why they are the way they are and what's diminishing and what's going on with them. Um, there are plenty of doctors here that I'm sure are going to explain that better than I do. Um, so I really want to focus on the part of why power of positive persuasion is so good and so it, it just makes sense, and you're going to see that it's actually productive, and this is why. Because our emotions are formed when we're very young. Um, and again, I'm not going to speak clinically, but I've heard that about three years old, we are who we are. Whether we're timid, shy, loud, courageous, bold, whatever it is. Maybe I'm, you know, life of the party, maybe I'm the wallflower. But those kind of emotions and those fears and those anxieties, a lot of times stem from when we're very, very small. So, as we live and as we grow and as we build memories, those things are building up upon those emotions. So I would say like this here morning, um, and I kind of picture metaphorically that those emotions are kind of wrapping around our brain, if you will. So those are pretty solid for now, okay? And what I'm going to show you is that they stay solid throughout our lifetime, okay? So as we're building and as we're building those memories, I might start with some childhood memories, and then I'm going to go, you know, I go to college, and then I get married, and then I have kids, and then I have grandkids. So all those memories are building upon those emotions in, in our brain. So, of course, unfortunately, with Alzheimer's, with forms of dementia, those memories are stripped away. Those parts of the brain are starting to diminish, and they're not coming back. Um, as those things diminish, we still go back to that basic of our emotions. 
And that's what I want to show you today. We're also going to be doing some role playing at the end, and I want you to pay attention to how I am appealing to those emotions. Um, and I like to give the example of, you know, okay, so so we're in here, and uh, you know, Mary over here is really anxious, and I say, calm down, Mary, calm down. Is Mary going to calm down? Does anybody ever calm down? My ex husband used to say that, calm down. I'm like, calm down. So, you know, just saying that, he didn't appeal to my emotions. He didn't calm me down. He just told me to. Well, you know, I fight that. Um, what about when you're confused and someone just says, oh, be patient or hang on? You know, if I'm standing here and I don't know what I'm supposed to do, can you imagine the anxiety coming up? Can you imagine, you know, the feeling? She's just looking at me going, Stay there, you're good. And I have no clear direction. How is that helping me? How is that appealing to my emotions? Um, and then I always love the one that when someone says, you know, if you say, gosh, I'm really sad, or maybe somebody's dealing with depression, you say, well, just be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's a game changer. So, um, you know, so, so again, if you appeal to that and try to help me, you bring me some chocolate cake and a cup of coffee, I'm probably going to be much happier. <laughs> But, you know, I just want you to, be, to pay attention to what do you react better to, you know? So instead of saying, maybe we can start showing. So please keep that in mind. Um, and, and just a note that, you know, don't we all follow better when we have clear direction? And we'll get into that as well. Um, the next part is what to hold on to and what to let go. And I always think of that Kenny Rogers song, you know, know when to hold them and know when to hold them. And I'm basically going to show you two different sides to this. And again, tuck this away where you need to tuck it so that when these things come up, you have them in your tool belt. I can be telling you a scenario today, and there's a good chance that you're going, that didn't happen, that never happened with them, that's not going to happen with them. And then tomorrow it happens. So that's where I want those tools that you'll be able to pull out and say, okay, I didn't think that would happen, but it did. <coughs> So the things that I want to encourage you to hold on to are character, dignity, respect, value, and voice. And I deal with so many families that are like, yeah, we get that, we do that. And then as I'm talking to them, that you know, they're missing three out of the five, or they're missing four out of the five. So I just want to break down real quickly character. Again, those emotions and character is pretty much formed, um, you know, at, at a young age, and it's just enhanced or diminished as we get older. But character is very important. I want somebody to know my character if they're dealing with me and I can't voice my concerns. Um, dignity. Dignity is so big. Again, that story that I told where she scolded that lady for not knowing, it hurt me knowing that that stripped her of her dignity. That that poor woman who, I don't know what she did, I don't know what her background is, but chances are years before she could have found the same room again. So dignity is so important. Respect. You know, I know that, again, especially if you are caregivers caring for someone, a spouse, a parent, um, those roles change. That spouse may not be more like a child. That parent may be more like a child or childlike thing. So that if you, you feel like you have to be put in the role of I have to be the parent, I have to be. Yes, you have to be the responsible one. Yes, the burden has to fall on you. But that is still your mom, that is still your dad, that is still your husband. So that level of respect still has to stay intact. Value. Again, bring their value to life. Who are they? What did they like to do? You know, come on, Miss Mary, you love to do puzzles. Let's sit down and do a puzzle together. Um, simple household chores, things like that. Those are great things to get them involved to build value. You know, my grandma loved to crochet, so that was her value. That's how she showed love. You, if she loved you, you got an afghan, you know. Um, so that was her value. So that can't go away. We have to stick with that as well. And then voice, I think, is really important. And sometimes we do not have that option. Sometimes people are blindsided. And they didn't know it was coming, or maybe they didn't see it, and all of a sudden now we're past that stage. But I want to encourage all of you, that if you know somebody that is early stage, maybe they've just been diagnosed, maybe you're seeing some things, but they haven't been diagnosed, please ask them what their wishes are. This is so, so important. Um, find out where they stand medically. That's going to be really important for you and for them. Find out where they stand financially, and I'm going to tell you exactly why that's so important. Um, find out where they are spiritually, emotionally. 
because again, that burden is going to fall back on you, so you're going to want that backing. That as difficult as that is that she's accusing me of stealing, she told me that she wanted me to have that house. So please, please uh, pay attention to that. Again, remind them, of who the, uh, remind them of who they are. And sometimes that is daily, sometimes that is minute to minute. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're correcting them. I don't have to put them in the chronological order of where they are. So I may not, I mean, I want to tell, you know, I'm, I'm your daughter. I don't have to say that. I just say I love you and your family. So I'm reminding who she is. Oh, Mary loved to do that. You know, Mom, you love to do that. That's what I say reminding who they are. That's what I want to hold on to as long as I can. Um, and if there's something that I really, really want to stress today to all those people that are caring for someone with dementia is lighten up. Yeah. Lighten up. Lighten up. Um, as important as it is that mom looks good in her socks match, that is not the end of the world, okay? Um, and learn to laugh. Learn to laugh because they say funny things. I have a lady, this was back in Georgia, and of course, you know, I call everybody Mr. and Mrs. Jones. But Mrs. Jones was 96 years old. Her son, I'm sorry, her grandson, had said that she was a car her entire life, and that was no different with full-blown dementia. But she, of course, had good days and bad days, good times, bad times. So usually we could cut up pretty good, and on those good days I could rip on her, she'd rip on me back, and we'd have fun, and we'd go. So I'll never forget this. I was giving a tour. This was at All Memory Care. I was giving a tour, and uh, I had probably two of the most uptight ladies I've ever had in my entire life that I had to give a tour to. And Stone Cold, and of course, they're in denial. My mom's not that bad, you know. So I'm trying to be, you know, professional, and I walk, I come around the corner, and I'd say hi, like I do to everybody as I'm going by. Hey, Miss Jones, hey, Mr. Jones, hey, Bobby, Mary. And I get to her, and I said, hey, Mrs. Jones, and she looks at me, and she says, you two bit whore. <laughs> so, so when I put on this father, I panic, I crack a joke. So I said to the two stone-faced ladies, I said, I don't know what she heard, you know. <laughs> and everything was good, but on a day-to-day -day basis, 
And some of you even know who I might be referring to. That was her comfort. She had to have those layers of clothes on. That's what she did herself. So every now and then I'd be like, let me count your layers. And I'd count them. And I'd say, I said, you're 11. And I said, aren't you hot? And she was, no. And I, I feel like, oh, she doesn't feel like she's burned enough. But it wasn't my place at that point. I tried once and said, can I take some of those off? I'm afraid you're getting too hot. She said, oh, I'm not. You know, we joked. I said, if I knock her over, she won't be able to get back up. And, you know, we laughed about that. But her dignity wasn't challenged at that time, okay? So hygiene appearance, I hear all the time, gosh, my mom took a shower every day and she had to dress impeccable and her lipstick was on and all that. And that's great. And we want to hang on to that as long as we can. But when that goes, it's okay. Um, I, I know a lot of us are always so afraid of, you know, what other people are going to think or, you know, what are they going to say. But right now our focus is going to be on mom. Okay. Um, so class and cooth. So, hmm, um, things come out. So I, I heard a very good speaker uh, one time say, you know, that what, what we used to, you know, have that little filter that, oh, that's not appropriate to do in front of everybody, that filter may be gone. So again, it may be embarrassing. Always weigh it out. You know, where are we going to be? What do I need to do to make sure, you know, that mom isn't embarrassed if she does that or dad does that. Um, but maybe just again, kind of lighten up and make a joke. Oh, didn't know she was going to do that, but okay, thanks, mom. You know, um, it, that's where that lighten up is really going to come in handy. So, false accusations, and again, this goes back to ha them having a voice. Um, knowing when my dad passed away, he didn't have dementia, but he was able to voice what he wanted exactly. We were able to follow that through, really took the pressure off of us. So, those false accusations, and I hear it all the time. Um, you know, but my daughter just stole my house and she put me here. Now what may have happened was my daughter was the last one that I saw when we were in the house. So you must have stolen my house because now I'm here. So again, we're not going to set them straight because her emotion is you upset me and I'm hurt. So the best way to handle that is to say, Mom, I'm so sorry. You know what? Nobody should lose their house. Acknowledge her pain. Acknowledge that. You don't have to say, I stole it, you don't, have to, you don't have to do that, but you certainly want to make sure that she knows that I hear you. Nobody should steal your house, and I'm going to try my best to redirect immediately. What was your favorite room in the house, Mom? Oh, that green looked great, and then we talk on there. But she's probably not going to get to that other part if I hadn't addressed that emotion, first and foremost. Um, I like to share this story because this really kind of ties into what to let go of and, and what to hold on to. I was working at an all-memory care place in uh, Georgia, and there was a gentleman that lived across the street, and they were all personal, I'm sorry, they were no memory care, they were all personal care, and then we were all memory care. So I had known this man for probably a year or so before he came to live with us. Well, it got to the point that where he was in a personal care home, he wasn't able to fit in. So he had a lot of very, very extreme sexual behavior. So his, what he said and what he did was downright embarrassing. So because the place that he was at, again, it was a good place, but they're not trained in memory care. They didn't know how to handle it. Of course, you know, hey, can you take him? So we did. And his very first day there, um, I looked over and I was talking to one of our family members. And I looked over and he said and did something pretty lewd. And I just said, oh, no, thank you. And I turned around. I just don't make eye contact. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get people to move in? Remember those two stone faced <laughs> ladies? This man would have, they would have ran out the buildings, all I can say. Um, but, you know, I was, I was worried about that. And I thought, oh my gosh, how is this going to work? So I, had, I don't remember the time lapse, but I, had, uh, I was on a tour. And of course, you know, the first person we run into around the corner is him, and he's alone. There's no caregiver, there's nobody there to bail me out. I'm like, oh no! <laughs> so I stumbled upon this realization by accident, but I, I want to share this with you too. This coincides with reminding them who they are. Um, unfortunately, I am horrible at remembering ranks and where they are, but I will just tell you he was a very, very high ranking officer in the Air Force. Um, he was a prisoner of war, left for dead. 
He was a very intelligent man. His children loved him. His wife um, had just passed away right before he moved in. Uh, this man had a great quality of life. His kids say he was just the best dad ever, and now he's saying and doing these things. So we had come around the corner, and I just kind of clicked into that mode that I went, oh, Mr. Jones, hey, how are you? And as soon as he started opening his mouth, I could see that eyebrow go up, and I, oh, and I immediately introduced him as his rank of who he was. This is Mr. Jones. He was a, you know, a, a, you know, a massacre, you know, uh, a, a major in the U.S. Air Force, and this and that, and all of a sudden he's in a wheelchair, and his chest fills up, and his shoulders go back, and he said, good to meet you. And he shook their hand and we walked away. And that was a huge, huge, I didn't know on me until later down the road when I was like, wow, that was really powerful. Um, so again, I reminded him who he was. His dignity was still intact. I didn't, I didn't belittle him. I didn't say, oh, wait, watch out for this guy. You know, I, I kind of hid that and went to myself. Um, but, but, you know, I just want to paint that picture because there, there's some extreme cases like that, and then most often they're going to be a little bit, well, hopefully a lot less than that, but you can still kind of use those same tactics. Um, being realistic, or I'm sorry, being real in an unrealistic world. And this is where I like to talk about the burden. The burden that we carry as caregivers, as professionals. Um, we know that. So it is very important that, you know, that's, it's wonderful to see you all here because you're doing what you can to understand the disease and to try to be a good part of it. So I just want to encourage you, it's going to be a, it's going to be a daily battle, but that burden has to fall on you. So when, when my mom, you know, sorry, she's younger than me, I'm calling her mom, but when my mom is accusing me of that, I don't have to make that right. The burden is going to have to fall on me. And I hate that maybe Mark sees and goes, wow, did she really steal my mom's house? You know, I can deal with that later if I have issues. But right now, the burden that, Mom, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. You know, nobody should hurt you. Nobody should steal that, you know. So the burden has to fall on me. And that's hard. And again, I'm going to go back to that's why you have to lighten up and laugh. Um, I'm not here to set them straight. I'm not going to correct them. I'm not going to make them better. I just want to make where we are right now in their world the best that I can make it. Um, so another thing that kind of goes in with that is that we like to say, we like to give all these explanations to those that are dealing with dementia. We want to explain so that we feel better. Um, we say way too many words. And the analogy I use in all the men are like, yeah. Uh, women say five times the amount of words that men do. <laughs> See, another woman and other men are like, yeah, you know. So I always say, I mean, that, that being said, how much can we shrink that to somebody with dementia? And again, it's going to coincide with that dignity, with that trying to understand them. Because if I go to them and I say, Mom, I'm picking you up tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We're going to go to Dr. Brown and he's going to check out your knee. And I don't want you to wear that sweatshirt. You have to wear that dress tomorrow. Please make sure that you eat. Because I feel better, because then when she accuses me, that you didn't tell me that, I, yes, I did, Mom, I gave you every detail. I, you know, and what she may have heard was dress, or the doctor, usually the doctor is what they hear. Um, so, you know, what good did I do? And again, that burden didn't fall on me, I put that burden on her. And whether she's early stage and going, oh my gosh, I should know what she just said, and I didn't. Or she's later stage and going, huh, who, what? So, you know, again, I, I want to put that burden back on me. Um, know when to pull rank. Know when, just like as a parent, I, I have five children, and you kind of let go and go, you know when, when I got to pull mom card. I got to be bad cop. And there are times that you're going to have to do that. And that's where hopefully you're going to have a network of people, uh, a community that's going to be able to help you if you're struggling with that. But taking their medicine. Um, that's going to be one of those times that you have to pull rank, and we're going to do that in role playing in just a few minutes. Um, hygiene, you know, that's fine that maybe mom didn't want to take a bath today, but by tomorrow we're looking at a week. So what do I do to get her to take that bath? And then eating. So if they're still able to eat and their bodies are accepting that food, we want them to eat. So, um, you know, I'm going to have to kind of pull rank on that, and we're going to show that. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help. 
I think that is one of the number one things with, with caregivers is they're afraid to ask for help. It shows weakness, it shows that maybe I'm not the good spouse because I promised that I would take care of her or I would take care of him. And, uh, and that's okay. Again, the burden's going to have to fall on you. You may not be spouse of the year that, that day, and that's okay. Um, so let's go ahead and do, we have some time, let's go ahead and do some role playing. And uh, the first person we're going to call, this is Lynn Franklin, and she is with Home to Home for Seniors. And um, you know what, let me have a this here. You may just have to yell or I'm going to try to stand close to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Lynn is basically going to demonstrate somebody who just doesn't want to bathe. And this is, again, what I have found. Oh, see, fire, thank you. So I want you to know that any of the actors that are coming up here today, we have not rehearsed this. We basically had a two-minute conversation. I said, listen, I'm going to drive you up and you're going to kind of be a guinea pig. But like I told Lynn, I said, I just want you, because she has dealt with this, you know, I want you to think about some of the things that you've heard over your career about how you don't want to take a bath. So I'm going to try to demonstrate to you um, some of the techniques that I have used that have worked. I want you to pay attention to what kind of environment am I creating for her. I want you to pay attention to um, the positive persuasion. I want you to pay attention to my feeling of her emotions. Um, so, and, and basically what I, what I told all the people that are going to help me today is, you know, I want you to give in when you feel that I have actually done what I need to do. There are some people that it may never happen, and that's okay. So we'll just go ahead, and, and I'm going to come in, and I'm going to say, hey, Miss Lynn, I'm a caregiver. Picture me a caregiver, maybe at a facility, okay? Hey, Miss Lynn, how are you? Hi. Hi. I'm here to give you a bath today. Oh, honey, I already done that. Oh, you did? Sure. Oh, okay. Can I give you one today? I don't think so. No. no. She's good. She's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but this, this is, she's exactly what happened. So what I maybe want to do is I maybe want to get down a little bit more and say, I love this green outfit. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Yes, it's very nice. Hey, tell me about your granddaughter. Is it granddaughter, grandson? Grandson. Grandson. What's his name? Jackson. Jackson. Oh, yes. He coming to see you soon? I think. I think so. He may be coming today. I guess I can check. Can you come with me and I'm going to see if we can get you all pretty up for when he comes? Can Where are we, we going? Where I'm going to show you. You want to come with me and I'll show you. Okay. So that is a positive persuasion. Okay, so I'm not forcing her, I'm taking her hand, so I am giving her that cue that I want you to come with me. I'm going to smile because I'm going to set the tone. If I go up to her and I'm going, Lynn, it's time for your bath, you need to go do this, Lynn is not getting up. Okay, so sometimes in us ladies love flattery, I'm going to tell you that. So when we start saying, eyes, and so basically my goal, that was a very short, but that's, that's very realistic. Thank you, Lynn. I guess Sometimes that's a 15-minute thing, and again, if she was like, oh, no, I'm not having it, again, I have to know when to hold and know when to fold and say, okay, and walk away, and maybe tag team someone else, or maybe I give it a little bit and I come back, and I'm going to show you with Miss Wendy in just a minute. So I'm going to call up uh, Pat O'Kane and Wendy O'Kane. These are friends of mine from Always Best Care. And I'm going to Miss Wendy sit here. Gonna get it's not rehearsed and I never know what I'm gonna get with Pat. Yeah. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> so I had asked Pat to be my aggressive male. I said I need an aggressive male. I'm not sure why. Right, right. <laughs> because this is something, and again, this might be a little bit more of an extreme case, but right after I was trained in this, exactly two weeks to the date, this is pretty much what happened. And I was like, oh. So let's go ahead. So Pat, you do your thing. What do you have planned for me today? I need you to um, go to the uh, <laughs> 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 store. <laughs> you need to, we're going to the doctor today to um, get your meds checked. What doctor? 
Your uh, diabetes doctor. I don't have diabetes. <laughs> well, I, I, well, you were diagnosed many years ago with it, and we go to the doctor every month. What is your name? No. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Frankie. Do you not remember me? Who, who are you to me? I, I'm your wife. Do you not remember? No. <clears throat> are you sure? So again, what are we doing today? Today we're going to the doctor. Why, why is it you can't understand me? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Why, why we have to go to the doctor and what doctors do? Well, I, th th we do this every month, honey. We go to the doctor, we get your, we get your blood sugars checked, we go through all of that stuff. I don't remember that. Well, I, it, it's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't want you to get upset. I'm upset. I don't want to go. No. Hey, no. sir. Hey. Hi. Come here. I want to show you something. What is your name? My name is Kim. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you exactly who's in charge and what we're doing today. Who are you? My name is Kim. I'm here to help you today. What can I do for you? Help me. I'm gonna help you. So that's just one little scenario. Don't leave yet. That's one little scenario. He was supposed to be more angry than that. <laughs> <laughs> I really expected more. Uh, he was, he was like, I'm so nice, I can't. But uh, now, yeah, that was gonna be me. Wait till I get up there. Uh, but basically, what I want to do, the, the point that was that I, she's already cornered. Okay. So the more agitated that he's getting, and she played a perfect part of somebody who maybe doesn't quite understand that, you know, she keeps repeating the same thing and trying to get him to understand, and he's already saying, I don't have diabetes and I don't go to the doctor. So a couple mistakes I just want to point out that we do, we all do, is we let ourselves get cornered. Okay, so if somebody's agitated, if somebody tells you he was supposed to say, like, you know, don't make me hit you, um, and that is a realistic thing, and I've come up upon that plenty of times, and I've had to, hey, sir, you know, address them who he is, and it's usually a male, we've had some females too, but usually males, usually they go back to military, so they kind of go back into that, who are you, what's going on, um, so I just want to make sure that I distract him, that I pull him away from what's agitating him, that's going to be really important, um, and then try to be on his side. So if he were to be coming at me, and he's angry, and he's telling me he's going to hit me, First of all, I'm going to stay in a safe distance because if he says he's going to hit me, he has every intention of hitting me. Now, maybe 10 years ago before the disease, he wouldn't hurt a fly. But right now, he's pretty agitated. He may not see me as a woman. And, and the first hit that I took to the face in all my career was about five months ago. And I was somebody in the military to him, and he told me off good. Um, turned around and just kind of sucker punched. I didn't see it coming. And then the word, I had no idea, and then the words that he said after gave me the clue that he was in full military code and I was some guy that was bothering him. Um, so I want to keep that safe distance. Obviously, he's stronger than me. Um, so what he says he could do, he, he does. But I want to make sure that he sees that I'm engaging. So my eye contact is going to stay with his. I'm going to try my best, even though I might be shaking inside, to try to come off that I'm confident, but not cocky. I don't want to be um, intimidating to him. I don't want to manipulate him, but I want him to know basically I can stand my own, but my eyes are also going to show that I'm here to help you and I understand. Most of the time that I have seen in my experience with aggression is because somebody's not understanding. So even though she may be correct, we're in an unrealistic world. So. All she did was agitate him, and she doesn't understand him. So I have to come in, maybe I'm another family member, come in and let him know that I'm on his side. Let's not worry about her right now. What is it? What, you know, what can I help you with? Well, I'm mad, and she told me this, or I'm going to throw this. I understand. In certain cases, I have reached out my hand. Um, and uh, sometimes that's really scary, and it, and it helps if you know the person to know again and from appealing to that emotion. Maybe I remind him, sir, I understand. I know that you're a colonel in the Army, and I certainly don't want to uh, disrespect you. What can I do? Who can I get to help? And then I'm going to look for those cues that he's going to be giving me that I can now kind of keep engaging in that role playing, if you will. And then once he's calm, we're good. Now we can go back into whatever mode we need to go back into. Um, so thank you, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Wendy, I just want.
want to just say, so basically, because I said that there's some times that I have to pull rank. So maybe with the bathing, okay, it didn't happen that day. If Lynn wasn't going to cooperate with me, there comes a point that I'll, I tag teamed and it didn't work, that I may just have to let it go. Maybe Tuesday's not going to be her shower. Maybe Wednesday will be. Um, but some of the things that I really have to pull rank on, excuse me, are, um, I'm going to, you're going to do, let's say doesn't want to take medicine, because I think that's a good one. Even eating. Um, I can usually distract a little bit, make them something different, put it in front of them, walk away. So eating sometimes is even a little bit better, but meds, I can't do that. Um, if I'm caring for someone at home, I can't just say, okay, here's your meds, take them, and I walk away because she's mad at me. I have to make sure she eats some. I have to make sure that she uh, ingests them. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm basically going to give Wendy some, I'm going to try to give her her meds, and uh, Wendy's not going to have it. Hopefully not too long in that. Hey, Miss Wendy, how are you? Fine. Hi. Hey, did you eat your breakfast this morning? Yes. You did? Yes. Okay. I have some medicine for you? No, no medicine today. No. no. It no. makes my stomach hurt. Oh, no. What if I got you a piece of toast? No, I no. don't like toast. Oh, okay. okay. Um, hey, what did you do this morning? I didn't see you until just now. Well, I, I got to go outside and see the flowers. Oh, and you like flowers? I love flowers. Really, what are your favorite flowers? I love peonies. Peonies. Who doesn't love peonies, right? Mm -hmm. How about if we go ahead and just try taking these meds real quick and we'll no, go outside no, and see No, no, no. Very realistic. <laughs> this is really what happens. No. <laughs> You're trying to poison me. No, I wouldn't try to poison you, and that's what everybody always says. So you might try that once, and that probably isn't going to work real well. Um, oh, I think that you think that. I would never want to poison you. And you said your belly's a little upset today? Just a little. But Can I get you something that might make you feel better? What would make my stomach feel better? Would you think some applesauce would be good? Maybe. I Maybe. do like applesauce. You do? Yes, okay. I do. Tell you what, if you want to stay, I will get you some applesauce and we'll go get some peonies outside. Okay? That would be lovely. Okay. So it took a little, again, we didn't rehearse that. And it might be really simple, but that is a very, very realistic thing. Yeah. Um, so again, I want to get her to do what I want her to do. I want to appeal to that emotion because flowers, that's, what she, that's the information she gave me. And even though she didn't start with saying I love flowers, you know, or I love coffee or I love chocolate cake, but if you pick that up in conversation, that could be something that's clicking at that time. So I want to make sure that, that I appeal to that as well. Um, thank you, Wendy. I appreciate it. That again, kind of tuck away, if you will, and you know when you have to bring it to the surface. Watch your environment, it's ever changing. Watch that three legged stool. Is it physical? Is it environment? Is it medicine? Um, so make sure that you're watching those things. Give yourself permission to laugh and cry. Give your family permission to laugh and cry. We're never laughing at them. But when Miss Jones found out what she told me, she laughed harder than I did. So we had a good laugh about that. And I'll be honest with you, Ms. Jones and I had cries together too, and that was okay. Um, know that you are not alone. And I think that this is so important for everybody in here to realize and to really take to heart, is that through the Alzheimer's Association, you have an entire community that's here for you. There's 24-7 uh, support phone call. The association is, is staffed very well with knowledgeable people to direct you to who, what, where. There's a lot of information online. So please do not isolate yourself. We are all in this together. Okay. Thank you all so much. Come here.